This is the GSMC Business Podcast. I'm Farrar Hutkins. Thanks for tuning in. The Daily Telegraph has some interesting news from Greece today. In an effort to stamp out tax dodging, the Greek government is prepared to levy fines on people who don't spend 30% of their income electronically. The government says it expects to raise over $800 million per year under this system. Those who fail to meet the requirement will face a 22% tax on the shortfall. So, for example, if you only spent 20% of your income electronically, you'd be taxed 22% on the remaining required 10%. Many Greek workers are paid their wages in cash, which means they'd have to convert their earnings into electronic funds in order to meet the requirements, which includes debit cards, credit cards, bank transfers, and e-commerce. Many countries in Southern Europe have a booming shadow economy, And at about 22% of gross domestic product, Greece's is the largest. Since Greece's financial crisis a decade ago, its economy has started growing again, but slowly. Its output remains below levels seen before the crisis. Back in June, stocks of electric automotive company Tesla hit a 52-week low. Since then, they've rebounded by almost 92%. It was not that long ago that Tesla was the new kid on the block in the world of electric vehicles, but in China there are some even newer kids on the EV block, even as Tesla opens its first plant in that country. Dozens of Chinese startups have collectively raised over $18 billion in funding, and whether it's a bubble or not, it is making headlines. China wants to use electric vehicles to reduce air pollution. Guangzhou Xiaoping Motors Technology unveiled a five-seat electric SUV last year called the G3, and sales are just under 12,000 units so far. But an employee of that company, an ex-Tesla engineer, has been sued by their former employer accused of intellectual property theft. A second employee who used to work at Apple is also facing trial on similar charges. Then there's NIO Incorporated, which offers several different models with combined sales of about 26,000 units so far. However, NIO lost $2.8 billion on sales of $1.2 billion in the last fiscal year. And since their IPO last year, their stock is down over 65%. NIO also just laid off another 141 employees at its North American headquarters in San Jose, California, That's the third round of cuts this year to its U.S. workforce, whose responsibilities are mainly research and design. NIO is backed by Tencent Holdings Limited, a Chinese multinational conglomerate, which also happens to be the world's largest gaming company. Evergrande Group, China's second largest property developer, has invested nearly $4 billion in EV-related companies and plans to launch its own brand called Hengqi next year. They plan to raise their stake in Swedish electric vehicle company NEVS from 62% to 86%, which will cost another $3 billion, and they're budgeting $6.3 billion for EV through 2021. And those are just some of the startups in China looking to get a better foothold in the EV market. Maybe that's why Tesla's Gigafactory 3 in Shanghai opened ahead of schedule with an initial production goal of 250,000 units per year and plans to double it over time. The Gigafactory 3 is the first fully foreign-owned auto plant in China. Meanwhile, an EV startup in Israel called REE is in the middle of a round of funding that values the company at about $580 million. REE plans to manufacture vehicles with motors in the wheels and is partnering with Hino Motors, that's the truck-making subsidiary of Toyota. The REE concept platform is a six-wheel design intended for trucks up to four tons. The aforementioned NEVS in Sweden, Saab's all-electric successor, acquired Protean Electric, which manufactures in-wheel motors as well. While Tesla's Cybertruck and its shattered windows were making headlines and punchlines, Edmunds.com awarded the company's Model 3 sedan the top spot in its best electric vehicle category. Back in February, the Model 3 outsold the Chevrolet Volt to become the all-time best-selling plug-in electric car in the U.S. The Model 3 first went on sale back in 2017, but newer doesn't necessarily mean better, said Edmunds Chair Alistair Weaver in a statement. 
Tesla plans to fill a gap in its lineup soon. That gap being the small SUV or crossover category. The Model Y is the car maker's compact crossover utility vehicle scheduled to start delivery next summer. That is, if all goes to schedule, with the 740-acre Gigafactory 4 in Berlin, with a capacity to produce 500,000 Model Ys and Model 3s. Tesla's Model Y may end up in competition with Mercedes-Benz's planned compact SUV, the EQA. Back when it was in the concept phase, it looked like an electric hatchback, but now the EQA is set for fully fledged production next year, and it looks remarkably like their GLA crossover. Mercedes-Benz wants to have ten electric vehicles on sale by 2025. So far, they have one: the EQC. It looks like Tesla is streamlining its customer service too. Four current and former employees of Tesla spoke anonymously to Business Insider magazine, saying that Tesla is merging the roles of its sales and delivery employees. It looks like Tesla has decided that it's better for the customer to have a single point of contact for the entire purchasing process. One employee would handle sales, paperwork, and delivery. Unlike other automakers, Tesla owns and operates its own stores, and the demands on its delivery department have grown over time. In order to meet demand at the end of a quarter, Tesla has occasionally recruited employees from other departments to handle deliveries. This could suggest that its delivery staff are already spread thin. Tesla's sales operations have already had somewhat of a topsy-turvy year. In February, it announced that it would close most of its stores, but then revised the message to say that only the low-performing locations would be shut. Meanwhile, Audi is dipping its toes into the waters of EV. Ridesharing, the German auto manufacturer, specifically its arm Audi Business Innovation, is testing out a new service in southern Germany called Bits. B i t s、It、uses gasoline and electric vehicles in its fleet. Audi is using a company called Fleetonomy to manage its fleet. Fleetonomy is a fleet management service that also offers ride-hailing app services. An initial test of the service in October was deemed successful, and so Audi plans on going ahead with services to pair appropriate vehicles with customers' destinations: an internal combustion vehicle for longer trips, electric vehicle for shorter ones. Coming up after the break: toys, toys, toys. Happy holidays! Stay tuned. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching.、Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage from news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network, guaranteed to fill that podcast itch, whatever it may be. Visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. This is the GSMC Business Podcast. I'm Farrer Hutkins. Thanks for joining me. Well, it may look like something you don't want to feed after midnight, but even people who haven't seen the Disney Plus streaming series The Mandalorian are all a Twitter over Baby Yoda. Hasbro, which owns the rights to Star Wars branded toys, has announced its first line of Baby Yoda toys. While technically it's not Baby Yoda, retailers, manufacturers, and Disney are all simply calling it the Child. Fans will now be able to pre-order four toys, which will arrive next spring. The figurines will range from just over one inch tall to over six inches. There's also reported to be a plush one that talks. Toys R Us is aiming to make a comeback this time with more surveillance. After filing for bankruptcy and closing more than 800 stores last year, the iconic retailer has opened two new locations: one in Texas and one in New Jersey. The revamped stores will have sensors in the ceiling to track people as they walk around and look at toys. People, including children. Website iO9 wrote last week that Toys R Us is. 
monitoring where kids go to produce data for brands. Ouch. U.S. law does have protections for children's privacy. For example, the COPPA Children's Online Privacy Protection Act is a law designed to protect the rights of kids under the age of 13. Retail Next, the supplier of the cameras, says that the units have been programmed to ignore anyone under four feet tall. When you consider that a 10-year-old can be a foot taller than that, it does make you wonder. Retail Next also says that all traffic data are anonymous and that faces are blurred. Welcome to the new brick-and-mortar shopping experience where retailers want to collect the same information about you as they would if you were shopping online. Of course, there are plenty of reasons people prefer shopping online versus the good old brick-and-mortar stores. To go shopping online, you don't spend any time sitting in traffic or circling the parking lot searching for a spot. Why do that when you can sit at home or wherever and use your phone or tablet to order whatever you need and have it dropped at your door just a few days later? Most online stores offer fast delivery, free shipping, easy returns. It's easy to see why someone would ditch the crowds and choose the simpler route of online shopping. If you want to order clothes, pet supplies, or the latest beauty item you saw on YouTube, online shopping provides you that access and near-instant gratification of making a purchase. You can shop in the middle of the night or when you're on the train. As the marketplace continues to grow and change, retailers are going to have to continue honing their websites and online shopping experiences to stay relevant. Businesses are realizing that in order to be competitive, they have to make their websites easier to use. The latest recommendation from influencers is to make checkout accessible on the same page as the item on view. See it, buy it, done. Stores such as Target and Walmart have two separate pricing systems, one online and one in store. Sometimes the prices match, sometimes they don't. And more people hunting for a good deal are shopping with their phones out, to check for the better deal and request the price match if the company's own website shows a lower price. Between online shopping and in-store membership programs, retailers are collecting an enormous amount of data to help forecast shopping habits, better tailor offers to customers, and, ideally anyway, to generate sales. Gathered data provides insight into people's buying habits, and the people organizing and analyzing that data are helping stores make better decisions about which products to carry and which incentives to offer. This is a kind of digital surveillance that's so important that the highest paid positions available for college seniors graduating this year are in data analytics. Speaking of surveillance, Facebook will now use information about your activity using Oculus VR. That's assuming you're logged into Facebook at the time. The company has updated its privacy policy, to include language declaring new social VR features. For years, Facebook VR headset users needed an Oculus ID to operate the system that could optionally be connected to what's called the Facebook identity. More recently, Facebook started requiring a login to access certain features, and Facebook says you must use your real name. And that'll do it for today's edition of the Golden State Media Concepts Business Podcast. I'm Farrah Hutkins. Thanks so much for listening. Let us know what you think of the show and subscribe if you haven't already done so. And remember, we're on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, so you can follow us there, too. Thanks, and see you next time.